Um, my name is Holly Honig. Uh, I joined the Empower Missouri team in June as their policy director. And I'm just so glad to be here in community with you all, especially when it comes to things like this, um, where we're coming together to help build knowledge and awareness within our community about poverty related policy issues. Um, today's topic is private probation. We're going to hear from a couple of folks about Missouri's private probation and supervision practices. Um, essentially, it's an unregulated for-profit business model that really preys on a person's financial and emotional vulnerability as they face one of the toughest times um, in their lives. This business model kind of uses a person's lower income status and related lack of power as a source of profit, adding unnecessary financial and emotional strains for folks involved with the criminal legal system and their families. And to be clear, it doesn't seem to be impacting people with the financial means to avoid those relationships. Um, it's further evidence of two criminal legal systems, one for those of us who can pay our way and one for folks um, who cannot. Um, our Criminal Justice Coalition brought this to the table this past year as an issue priority area. And as we began to better understand the uniquenesses in Missouri, we were fortunate to find a really terrific and informative report um, called Private Probation Costs, Compliance and the Probation or the Proportionality of Punishment, um, Evidence from Georgia and Missouri. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have one of its um, co-authors, Beth Hubner today, um, Amber or Sarah, can you advance to the next slide, please? And sorry, the next one after that. Um, there's Beth and, uh, and Sarah. So we have um, Beth here to talk to us today about that report. She's going to provide some context and background into the practices. And, um, and Sarah Yuri, who um, has a lived experience that she would like to share um, with us in the hopes of, of bringing about some change. So what you'll hear is that introduction to practices in Missouri. Um, you'll hear about how those practices are impacting one of our community members. Um, we'll provide an opportunity at the end for um, some questions and answers that you might have of uh, Beth and Sarah. And our goals um, for all of this is to build awareness, um, Hopefully we'll share enough information with each of you that you feel empowered to have conversations with other people um, in your lives. And we'd like to provide you some additional opportunities to engage in, in meaningful ways. Um, so we'll introduce Beth. Um, Beth is a professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Missouri St. Louis. Her background and credentials are extensive. I'm not gonna list them all. We will link those um, in the chat. Her principal research interests include the collateral consequences of incarceration, racial and gender disparities in the criminal justice system and public policy. So um, Dr. Hubner, Beth, welcome and thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. Of course, well, let me just share my um, screen here. Great, and so I'll just get started. Okay, does that look good to everyone? Great, thank you. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a research study that I did with Sarah Shannon, who's from the University of Georgia. Um, and you can read the title there. Um, but we were part of a larger study that looked at monetary sanctions, which is fines, fees, restitution in the state of Missouri. So I have a lot of background on economic sanctions in Missouri. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. I'm gonna to go pretty quickly so we have time for Sarah and for questions, but um, I do have a copy of this article. I'm happy to um, answer any questions as we move along. So I just wanted to give some of the voices here that we talked to. And we talked to over 100 people with fines and fees in both states, but um, this participant just said, I barely have enough money to pay you, but they want me to pay them too. And they want me to report here. And they also want me to report over there. And both of y'all want me to be working it's impossible to please everyone. So these are just kind of the tensions that people had when they were on private probation. So we do know that probation itself, which includes federal, state, and local, um, is the biggest, uh, includes the most people on supervision or under correctional control. So it's like 3.5 million people or one out of every 
uh, 72 adults. So that's why I focus a lot on probation is because this is more likely to touch um, everyone. And we do know that there's been an increase in costs, fines and fees assessed with the criminal legal system overall um, over the last two decades. A lot of that has been um, in line with decreased funding um, for local municipalities and some of the decline in income with the 2008 um, crash, economic decline. Um, so I, we wanted to ask some questions a little bit about like, what is a misdemeanor? What happens if you don't have money to pay? And what is court like? Um, and we found out, um, just to give it away, that the misdemeanor system is really low stakes and often absent of oversight. So by low stakes, it means like people have to pay a small amount of money, but again, they have little oversight. So I want to talk a little bit about the costs of private probation. Um, you know, probation costs in general are extensive. They're rarely described when you're sentenced, and they can be assessed arbitrarily. Um, monthly fees can go from $10 to $150 a month um, across the states that, that have been surveyed. And sometimes people have one-time fees of $330 to $600. And so what I think is most interesting about private probation is that like public probation for felonies in the state of Missouri is funded by Missouri, but private probation by state law in Missouri, and I have it in purple here, says neither the state of Missouri nor any county of the state shall be required to pay any part of the cost of probation and rehabilitation services provided to misdemeanor offenders. So again, this means that the cost goes directly to the person on probation. Um, and we do know that people can um, be revoked to jail, to prison for failure to make those payments if they can show that they've had willful non-payment. And we also know, again, this is statewide, this is also nationwide, that private companies have completely taken over corrections um, and have been used for debt collection and specialized treatment services. So again, there's little oversight of these systems, whether it be for your DUI, for um, electronic monitoring, anything like that. And again, these are third party actors who have a financial interest um, in corrections, um, not, a, not an interest in you know, rehabilitation. So one thing that we wanted to talk about is rituals of compliance. So what does this mean? Um, this means that these are all of the hoops that you have to jump through when you go to comply. And, and these costs, um, like Holly said, there's usually two tracks. Um, for, for many of you, if you have um, a fine, you can go to the court, pay it. Maybe you don't even have to go to the court. You can just pay it online and you're done. But people who are impoverished or do not have the ability to pay or don't have credit um, would have to have these other rituals, these other costs of compliance. And often when you don't pay, or if you don't pay on time, then that can lead to additional sanctions. And even just wanting to pay can uh, get you a service fee. So it's never just the amount, it's usually these other costs as well. And we do know that there's unique procedural costs of municipal courts. Like I said, these are often low stakes for many people. They just pay it off and they go by their, go on their way. But for other people who can't pay or don't have the means to pay or the, the ability to get to court, there's other costs there. Time, um, stress, uh, having people watch your kids, many things like that we can, we can talk about in our chat later. And so again, one of our main arguments here is that it's not proportional, right? So we often have this you know, prison sentence versus probation, but what we have found in our research is that people on probation are getting punished uh, disproportional to what they have done. Again, when we talk about misdemeanor probation today, we're talking about stealing cable, we're talking about traffic offenses, um, things like that. We're not talking about places in which people were injured or hurt or anything like that. And again, probation was originally designed to be um, an alternative to prison. Uh, but what we know nationwide is again, by having this private probation model is that we're bringing more people into the system that ever would have been there before. 
And what we're also going to talk today about is this pay only supervision. If you cannot pay, then um, you actually have to pay to not pay to be on supervision. So let me just tell you about our study really quick. So like I said, we did over 130 interviews with people with legal debt in both states. Those last an hour to two hours. And we talked to 90 decision makers total in those two states. And we sat in court for 400 hours in those two states. So this is a pretty extensive study over five years. And I wanna say thank you to Arnold Ventures who funded this. But as I said before, we have two themes in our research. And one is that there's just these rituals of, co of compliance. The costs for private probation are hidden. They're managed by third parties, which again, profit motive. Um, and what you have to do to comply is very um, often opaque and difficult. Um, and then proportionality. We know that if you could not pay right away, you're given a longer and harsher sentence than would be given often for felony probation. So just to give you a background, um, these uh, this is what the, the law is in Missouri. We have a max fee cap of $50 per month. Um, there is no oversight board. There is one in Georgia. The legislation is here in terms of House bill, and you can be on supervision for two years. Um, there is a number of other states that have private probation. And again, that's in the article. I'm happy to share that with you as well. Um, but again, Missouri is pretty much the, the least regulated of all the states. Um, and again, only 17 states have private probation. So I just wanted to give you a couple of voices, and I know that we're also going to hear from Sarah today, um, you know, about the high cost cost of probation. And, and what we see um, is that there's a lot of layered fees. So when we watch municipal court, there's this 40 year old woman on disability, and she had a total cost of about two thousand dollars. Again, so for a trespassing case, um, she was asked to pay a two hundred fifty dollar fine. And then she had a stealing case that was two years unsupervised pr probation, which means she was supervised or she was unsupervised. She had to check in, um, but she wasn't given any services like you do with felony probation. She also had to do a fine, complete 40 hours of um, community service. And then she had $50 a month for super supervision costs and had to attend a, a shoplifting class again. If you can add all these things up, they're pretty substantial in terms of that high cost of probation for, again, both of these are misdemeanors um, in the state of Missouri. So um, what are these challenges that people face when going to court and are not complying with these costs? And are they different, which I've kind of already told you it, they are. And so this is just another quote from one of our uh, participants, they said it was like a constant burning, torturous feeling of just trying to continue to um, keep up. And they talked about this piling on effect. It was one thing. It was the other thing. It was the other thing. And they talked about how life was a struggle. Like they didn't know what to pay. They didn't know how to pay first. Um, they just wanted to get off um, probation. And many thought, thought it was cumbersome to have these multiple requirements. Again, that's um, also not unique necessarily to private probation, but we did see more requirements often of private probation than um, public probation. Um, and so they just talked again and again about the strain. Um, they found that it was hard to comply with sanctions. Um, we actually saw a number of judges harassing people in court, threatening to go, threatening them to take them to jail. Um, in Georgia, actually, a couple of uh, judges told people to bring their toothbrush next time they came to court because he was going to send them to jail if they didn't pay something. So what, what we also see, and this is something that we see in a lot of our research, is judges wanted, wanted some indicator. They wanted some sort of performance that people were complying. So they talked about that they, they just wanted them to pay something. Um, but the, um, the problem is uh, that a lot of people had additional costs and other conditions that incurred these other costs, like electronic monitoring. And so they wanted them 
to comply by being on electronic monitoring. But as we see in, in many communities, electronic monitoring is, isn't free. So people had challenges getting on the electronic monitoring to show that they could comply. So it's kind of this chicken and egg you know, process they couldn't, they couldn't get either because they couldn't pay. And like I said, here's that quote about the person who um, needed to bring their, their toothbrush. So you can just imagine how much stress this puts on a client in the court. Um, and so we do um, think, or we argue that this is disproportionate in terms of what people have, have done. And I'll talk a little bit about that really quickly. So again, failure to pay costs can lead to longer sentences. This is true for state probation as well as it is for um, misdemeanor probation. They're not gonna let someone off probation with owed fees. Um, you can actually extend probation if people have not paid. And what we found that is unique also in the municipal courts is that you can put someone um, to pay only probation. And you could think of this as kind of like a layaway um, in that they would require people to go to court every month to pay, again, just to demonstrate that they could pay. Um, some courts, again, charged for that opportunity. They would have um, payment plan setup fees or court fees every time they came. And if they didn't have fees for that, then um, it's those opportunity costs, missed work, childcare, stress of coming into court. If you've ever been in municipal court, sometimes you have to wait an hour to be, be heard. And what I think is important to really highlight here too is that private companies have complete discretion for violation reports. No oversight for private companies. We could all get together on this call and develop a private probation company. Um, and there is no um, oversight of that. So if they say that you failed and tell the judge you failed, they did. Um, and so many people, um, this is a Missouri defense attorney, felt like these companies were out to get their clients um, because the more violations, the more people um, that they had on their system. We did see the other way. We saw some judges were very worried because no one had a, had a violation. They didn't want to violate people because then they would be off uh, electronic monitoring and maybe went to jail. So um, that was that was challenging in a lot of places. Um, again, just a few more comments before I pass it over, but we just do see a lot of collateral consequences. These are, you know, things again, in addition to the punishment. Um, you know, people went and put things on their credit card. Uh, we saw a lot of credit card debt, a lot of uh, very, very damaged credit that people were not able to get out of. And some people just kind of walked away. We saw that a lot. People would have stacks of bills and were just like, I'm not sure what to do. I can't pay them. Um, and we're not even going into the other debts that people often have, like healthcare debts and things like that. So um, again, I went through this really quickly because I know we have a lot to talk about, but we really wanted to talk about this is just such an opaque problem. Um, to be honest, when I started this, when I started this project, I knew about private probation. I did not know the extensiveness, um, and I was very surprised by the lack of oversight. Um, and one thing that we talked about, there's little if any assessment of the ability to pay in lower courts, um, which offered participants no reprieve from payment. As part of SB5 that happened after the killing of Michael Brown, um, there is a requirement of courts to have an ability to pay assessment, but oftentimes we saw in court, people didn't know to ask for that. They didn't know what that meant. It requires a lot of paperwork. And many people felt like, well, I only have $300 to pay. I don't wanna ask for that. But in fact, they were indigents and couldn't pay, but didn't know their rights in that way. We saw most people didn't know their rights at all. And often people asked us their rights, so we were observing court. And again, people on private probation really have few procedural rights. There's no one to complain to. Um, you know, there's no due process that way. And it's even less than those afforded in state supervision systems. And I should mention one thing too, they don't get any services. Um, you may feel one way or the other about, uh, you know, state probation, but they do provide services. And so these people are paying and, and getting those services. So, you know, one thing I want to just talk about in terms of implications really quickly, you know, we could get rid of private probation altogether. Many states don't have it, um, but we definitely need an assessment of ability to pay. 
Um, I'm not going to go into this uh, in great detail, but if you are in Missouri and you have a misdemeanor case, you cannot get access to a private defender. And so there's no way for people to get those services either. And finally, um, so that's something that we should talk about. And finally, you know, private, we should have some oversight. If we're going to have it, you know, what level of education should staff have? What are the failure rates? Do they have to report them to someone? And so that's the end of my presentation. So I'll stop sharing uh, and then we can go on to the other participants. So I went over a lot, but I'm happy to answer questions as we move along. Thank you, Beth. That was that was amazing. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, so for participants, for questions that you might have for Beth, we'd like to ask that you um, hang on to them or go ahead and put them in the group chat. If you're like me, you'll forget by the time you're done listening to Sarah what questions you had for Beth. We do have some time reserved at the end um, for um, that discussion set aside. Um, and we are going to um, post a link to the report um, that Beth is referring to, um, and we can repost the link to her bio as well. Um, so yeah, so we'll move on um, to hearing from Sarah. So we're also um, really honored to be sharing this space with Sarah Yuri, who, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, would like to share her personal story in hopes of bringing about um, some change. Sarah and her husband Lane have nine children, three of which are still in the home. Having completed nearly 5,000 hours of national service as the energy efficiency team lead, and then later the nonprofit partnership developer with the city of Bloomfield, Sarah knows firsthand just how poverty um, can affect our communities. Um, Sarah was also a dispatcher um, for the jail and one point in her career. Um, so she's also well aware of how the system fails our communities in so many ways and is currently feeling them. Um, Sarah's husband, Lane, is currently incarcerated um, in the Davies uh, County Regional Jail and has been since October, or excuse me, August 16th. Um, so we're gonna let Sarah share more about that. Sarah, welcome. Um, we're so glad to have you in this space and your willingness to share your story with us. Um, thank you. All right, thank you for having me. I do apologize, my video isn't working. So can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Okay, well, good. All right, um, well, let's get started with it from the beginning. Um, last December, my husband Lane was making a frantic trip to Kansas City to see his brother before he passed away. Um, he was stopped by a county officer, given three traffic tickets, all um, misdemeanors that um, he hasn't been able to obtain a lawyer to represent because literally the offense is so, um, what do I want to say? Um, it's such a mild offense that, um, you know, legal aid or anything like that, a court appointed attorney wouldn't be necessary because it holds no jail time. Okay, so he gets three traffic violations. Um, he doesn't make it to see his brother who's dying. And appearing in court, you know, was an absolute nightmare. Um, our family has been through so much this last year that um, we were really in quite a situation. I mean, we've had everything from E. coli, meningitis, COVID. My dad passed away. My children's dad passed away. You know, we've been quarantined. Um, uh, two pit bulls attacked my daughter and I. So, I mean, life has not been okay for a while, hence the poverty situation. Um, we were destitute and penniless and unable to make it to the court hearing on August 2nd. And this has been one of many that my husband hasn't been able to make it to. He knew a warrant would be issued for him and he called and turned himself in. Um, once he had done that, there was a $4,000 cash only bond. Um, obviously we weren't able to come up with that and it wasn't like a 10% bond. Um, it would have had to been 4,000 cash. Uh, he was put in jail and reprimanded there for several days and then released on his own recognizance. And the paperwork said that specifically, and I think that is significant. Um, 
but he was sent home with another paper instructing him to contact Supervision Services, who's out of Hamilton, Missouri. Um, it's a private probation company that I think is important to note that the man who is the executive director of it was also the director of this kind of service for the state of Missouri for the previous six or seven years prior to starting this nonprofit. Um, so he was instructed to contact them within 24 hours of his release. And, um, you know, he got released on a Saturday. I tried to call this man repeatedly until Monday. Um, we caught a hold of him and he said, you know, the judge isn't going to be real happy if I don't have that ankle bracelet on you before court tomorrow morning at nine. And I explained to him that we didn't have the money to go twice, that we, we had to go to court the next morning and that my husband didn't need a GPS monitor that cost $75 a month and $12 a day. He wasn't trying to avoid prosecution. Obviously he called and turned himself in. We were stranded at home. Um, we had no way to call, no way to get there. And uh, he wanted us in Hamilton by two o'clock that day. And I told him that wasn't gonna happen. So, you know, the next day we made it to court and the judge wasn't very sympathetic at all. He wouldn't listen to my husband who had written a letter and trying to explain the situation. Um, they didn't let him speak at all. They asked him if he'd contacted supervision services and he said no. And um, the judge then tried to give him a drug test and he said, I don't understand. This is for a traffic ticket. I didn't get a drug charge. I'm not on probation or parole. Um, and because he refused that, they have put him in jail and he's remained in jail. He's had another court hearing since then and he wouldn't plead guilty. So they continued it till the 20th. Um, keep in mind, this is all, this is not all because of a traffic stop. This is because a person can't afford the cost, you know, to just pay it off. If he could have paid off the tickets the first time when we went to court before he even pled guilty or not guilty, they wanted all of the money. They wouldn't take any payment plan. We didn't have all the money, nor does he believe he was guilty for the tickets. Um, but it was an all or nothing thing with the judge and I'm not sure how that is okay. Um, considering, I know in other states, the state cannot re refuse any amount of payment. Um, let's see. You know, people that can pay the fine are treated different than people that cannot pay the fine. And the traffic ticket is what both people have to pay for the traffic violation. The only difference is that the person who can't afford to pay those fines up front have to go to court, and that means court fees. And if the judge and you do not see eye to eye, I guess that means jail time until you comply. Um, my husband also has mental health issues and um, he doesn't understand why he's in jail and neither do I. The judge revoked his bond after he let him out on his own recognizance and after he didn't get the GPS bracelet put on. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it is criminalizing poverty and um, you know, we couldn't even get representation for this because the offenses are so mild. It's a traffic ticket. Um, it, it's not part of the sentence to be put in jail, so he can't even get representation. Um, is there any questions so far? Sarah, this is Holly. You know, one thing I know when you um, first reached out and um, told me about everything you had going on, what stood out for me, in addition to all of the things that you've talked about, was the way that the um, private probation and supervision company represented themselves in court. Can you talk just a little bit about that and share that with the folks on the call, what that was like? Sure. Um, so we'd been to court several times and I sit there and, you know, notice this, the same people sitting um, where the jury would sit in the courtroom. And you think it is the court appointed attorneys because most of them are, but um, 
Anthony Lambert, who is the executive director for Supervision Services, is sitting there like one of the court staff. Um, I did think he was one of the court appointed attorneys and he came out into the hallway when my husband was getting arrested and was talking to me as if he was one of the attorneys and he was the um, Supervision Services executive director. He didn't identify himself and he sits there every time there is court, like one of the court staff, um, which I think is uh, not his job. Um, I definitely think it's overstepping. I don't know what exactly he's doing to help anything except for keeping the poor in poverty. And they're funneling everybody in that county through there. Um, their income and nonprofit information is available online. If they're charging nothing to the state and the state thinks that there's no cost to the state for this, they're wrong because it is hurting people. It's hurting me and my family. My husband isn't able to support his family right now because he's incarcerated. Um, and why? Why? Because the judge said, challenge me. As far as I'm concerned, the judge is wrong for trying to put a GPS monitor on him. Um, he isn't on probation or parole. And the fact that they are putting these on these people and then incarcerating them if they don't comply is ridiculous. We can't afford this. We couldn't afford to get to court. Um, so I want to do just a, a final um, expression of gratitude um, to you, Sarah, and to you, Beth, for being here with us today and sharing um, sharing your work and sharing your experience with us. Um, this is incredibly helpful. And um, I think uh, Sarah, our advocacy director, you have some, I think some final things that you wanted to include in the wrap up before we, before we let people go. Yeah, thank you so much. I want to um, mirror those comments from Holly. Thank you uh, to Sarah and to Beth for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate your um, sharing this information with us. This was something that um, Empower Missouri was really, I think, as surprised as many of you on this call to hear is such a common practice. Um, and we are excited to put um, some, some energy behind trying to uh, replace this system with something that works better for folks uh, who are struggling, uh, which so many of our neighbors are. So I have dropped in the chat box a link to our forum evaluation. We sure would like it if you would fill that out. You can do that while I'm speaking to you. You will not need to see anything on your screen uh, while I run over these next couple of slides. If you want to take this time to go and fill that evaluation out while you listen to me, uh, that would be fantastic. We use that to improve, um, to change our offerings, to uh, make sure we're responding to what you all want and need to hear and learn about. Um, in this pretty flexible hour of education we offer monthly. Uh, we are moving forward with the rest of our fall forums. You'll see here in October, we're gonna talk about tenant unions, the power behind uh, tenants coming together to confront the systems that uh, make it difficult to be a tenant. Tenants are very vulnerable in their housing situation when you consider uh, the power that landlords often hold. Um, and so we're going to talk about that in ways that we can address and shift that power around. In November, we're going to talk about a case for reparations. So that call has been growing across the country and in Missouri as well. So what could that look like? What would it look like? Um, how would it help to address some of the systemic um, things that are furthering poverty in our state for our community members? And in December, we'll get ready for the legislative session, which starts in January in Missouri. I'm sure many of you are excited uh, for that season to be upon us again. So in December, we'll do a legislative preview, just talking about Empower Missouri's goals, what we expect out of the legislative session, and uh, what we kind of know from lawmakers uh, to be watching for. November 15th and 16th is our Anti-Poverty Advocates Summit. Uh, in Jefferson City this year. We'll be at the Double Tree. We've got a great um, slate of offerings uh, available to you. And we're really excited to be back in person and sharing uh, and meals with all of you. 
um, as well. We have an early bird registration fee between now and the end of October. So please um, hop in there and grab um, those discounted rate tickets uh, as your earliest convenience. And then finally, just some information about how you follow up with us, learn more about us, uh, and keep in touch with the things that we're doing. Uh, in the chat box are the registration forms for the conference, uh, for the annual summit, as well as information about our upcoming forums, coalition calls, uh, other events and offerings that we would love to have you join us uh, for. And finally, if you need CEUs for today, that's an, a service we've been able to offer for many years at Empower. Uh, if you need CEUs as a social worker or if your other types of licensure will accept social work CEUs, please reach out to Christine. We're happy to do that. They are free for this hour. Um, and the information that we need is there in the chat box because we do need your name, your email address, your mailing address, uh, and the last four digits of your social security number. We do not want anybody else's last four digits of their social security number. So if you don't need a CEU, don't send that over to Christine, just if you do. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. Um, Holly put some contact info uh, in the uh, chat box. And if there's any other questions or thoughts before we uh, go, we certainly would be happy to hear it.